Hello from the Meisner Law Group and welcome to our webinar, Smoking in Michigan Condominiums, New Case Law and Best Practices. Mr. Robert Meisner will be our presenter today. He is the principal attorney and founder of the Meisner Law Group based in Bingham Farms, Michigan, where we have provided legal representation statewide for condominiums, homeowners associations, individual co-owners and developers for over 40 years. Mr. Miser was the first lawyer in Michigan and is among the select few attorneys in the country who have been recognized with fellowship in Community Associations Institute's College of Community Association Lawyers. His book, Condo Living 2, The Authoritative Guide to Buying, Owning, and Selling a Condominium is available at MomentumBooks.com. My name is Mark Petrie. I'm a legal assistant and director of community relations at the firm. So at this point, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Meisner and get started with the first slide in our presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and, and hopefully we can help uh, our listeners to some of the issues that come up in uh, community associations as they relate to uh, smoking. Uh, let me first say uh, as a disclaimer that anything I say is not to be construed as legal advice. So each one of your particular organizations or associations uh, have to rely on your own legal counsel uh, to make various decisions concerning uh, issues with smoking. I have to make that disclaimer. Uh, I might also indicate that I do smoke cigars, and I do want to briefly relate an incident I had in a condo in Florida where uh, I smoked my cigars uh, on the patio uh, but unfortunately, the president's wife of the association lived three stories up and one story over and didn't like the smoke. Uh, and so they decided to try to take a poll on how many people wanted to ban smoking in the condominium. Well, of course, that was not something that I wanted because I wanted to enjoy my cigar. Uh, and so I ended up having to go on a campaign uh, around the condo project and uh, tell the uh, members of the association the next thing they're going to want to want to uh, stop is alcohol drinking, you know, ban, ban alcohol. Well, fortunately, uh, the uh, proposal didn't work, um, but that was it for me in terms of living at that condo. So certainly I have been uh, involved in issues concerning smoking uh, personally as well as, you know, perhaps hundreds of times over the years in dealing with uh, odors from units uh, uh, that are not necessarily smoke, but uh, certainly we're, we're intimately aware of the uh, issue. So the first question that one has to ask is, does the association necessarily have to resolve every conflict over smoking? Now, we know that smoking is not good for you. Uh, doctors tell you not to smoke. Uh, there's secondhand smoking uh, that creates, causes cancer. Those are all relevant issues. Um, but unfortunately, they're not necessarily an issue that the association has to consider. Uh, because in every complaint about smoking, uh, it is an issue regarding neighbor to neighbor, unless uh, they smoke on the common elements and a number of people do it and nobody can you know, walk outside without inhaling uh, all sorts of fumes. So individual co-owners typically have the right to enforce the bylaws against other co-owners. And if there is a bylaw prohibition on smoking, then number one, the association can enforce it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and or number two, an individual co-owner would have a right to enforce it against another co-owner. It's sort of like if uh, your neighbor is an alcoholic and he bangs on the walls all the time, and you're the only one that's affected by it, the condo association then has to make a decision as to whether or not they're going to get involved in the excessive noise coming from the alcoholic uh, co-owner or tenant vis-a-vis uh, -vis the co-owner himself who has recourse uh, dealing with the issue. 
So again, does the conflict involve just two units or does it impact additional units or the common elements? That's one of the issues that the association has to consider in any complaint about smoking, regardless of whether or not the association has a bylaw prohibition on it. And of course, the association might decide to try to mediate the dispute uh, between two neighbors or recommend that they go to some sort of mediation tribunal to see if they can resolve the matter. But the amount of intervention on the part of the association is always uh, of questionable uh, results in terms of what you are going to want to do in that particular situation. You know, what is your interest in getting involved in the dispute to begin with? Now, obviously, there are possible uh, solutions uh, to the smoking issue. Not that I'm an expert in, in uh, air uh, purification, but first of all, there is the issue of education about dangers of smoking, referral to sources that can help them quit. So if you've got an incessant cigarette smoker that can't help himself, uh, but he really wants to, you know, maybe you can facilitate him going or her going to some place where uh, they can help him uh, uh, quit. Air purifiers. Well, I had an air purifier in my condo in Florida, but the smoke from the cigar uh, permeated through the door and did sm uh, infiltrate the hallways. Once in a while, I was a bad boy and, and smoked in my unit as opposed to the uh, patio areas. Uh, the association got me an air purifier, but it really wasn't very effective. And short of the kind of air purifiers you get in cigar lounges, and even then there's a question as to how effective they are, but that's one of the ways that either the co-owner or the association can contribute to the problem. Uh, another uh, complaint frequently by the co-owner is that the smoke is going through the ducts. Uh, there are cracks in the unit, openings, things of that sort. Uh, generally because of poor construction or just the way the duct work was established or constructed. Uh, if the association thinks that they can help the situation by dealing with uh, these uh, openings uh, or maybe the co-owner is willing to pay for it, uh, not likely, but that's another possibility, as well as insulation. Uh, as I said, duct work, designated smoking areas and the common elements. Maybe you decide that you're going to allow smo a smoking area and a common element, just like many to hotels do. If you go to a hotel, many times they'll designate someplace way in the back behind all types of uh, equipment uh, where you can sit in the dark and freeze and smoke. <laughs> assessment for mitigation. Well, that's that's another matter. Uh, again, um, another possibility that you might want to consider. Um, I'm 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 meant to mention at the beginning that you know this is the second recent uh, webinar we did. We did one on uh, the virus uh, about two three weeks ago, and we got a great reaction not only from our clients, but a number of people that have not uh, utilized our services in the past and uh, recognize that this is a complex issue, particularly in the area of collections. So uh, our uh, seminar from that day is available on our, our website. If any of you were not uh, available for that seminar, you can have it repeated if you, if you go on our website. Okay, let's talk about marijuana. Uh, why don't we do a survey? How many people listening to this uh, webinar are smoking marijuana right now or need oh, to? Oh, no. <laughs> I, I, no. I doubt there would be, there would be any uh, right now, but who Well, knows? wait a minute. We know, I know some managers that are listening in, and I guarantee they're oh, no. smoking marijuana. <laughs> but in any event, we'll go on, we'll go on without that uh, vote, all right? Marijuana. As everyone knows, recreational use is now legal under Michigan law, not federal law, under Michigan law. So you have a right to smoke marijuana. 
but the state law only removes criminal prosecution by the state, provided that you adhere to the limits for possession. So you're not really totally home free as it relates to smoking marijuana, but you're not going to be prosecuted for it. Now, if you're a landlord in an apartment complex, there's nothing that precludes you from banning the smoking of marijuana or the smoking of anything in your uh, unit, in your apartment building or in the apartment unit itself. Uh, And moreover, smoking can be banned by associations through an amendment of their bylaws. Let me repeat that. There is case law supporting the, the proposition that smoking can be banned by associations by amendment of their bylaws if they don't have the prohibition in their bylaws now. So if you have a smoking problem, as was my condo in a high rise in Naples, Florida, you can try to get the amendment of the bylaws to prohibit smoking. However, you may also want to suggest alternatives to smoking if the co-owner claims a need. Uh, that's, again, another way of trying to ameliorate the uh, situation. situation. Um, and as far as marijuana is concerned, you probably can't smoke it on the general common elements, as it would likely be considered a public place as opposed to a a private place. And there is an attorney general's opinion that is still good law, uh, was uh, Schulte a, a number of years ago, that opined on the issue of medical mar- on marijuana in general. And uh, that would be available to you if you called us or contacted us, we could get you a copy of that. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I, I can just jump in here actually, Mr. Meisner. So yeah. that is available as a handout. I do have that oh, okay. uh, available as a handout, which they can access through their control panel and download right there. Mm-hmm. You mean we're giving them something free besides my advice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Uh, yeah. Well, no. Okay. Well, well, that, uh, we'll put out a charitable a time in our country. Yeah, it's a charitable time <laughs> in our country. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, in any event, that that is something to look at. But basically, that and until there is a court decision to the contrary in this state, uh, and we have checked to see, and we're not aware of any uh, case decision that has come out regarding that attorney general's opinion to refute it in any way. It's the law of the state. Uh, so for all intents and purposes, just because you need mar- medical marijuana doesn't mean that you can necessarily use it uh, if there's a prohibition on smoking. Uh, and uh You know, you may not be able to use it on the common areas, regardless of the situation, if it's deemed to be a public place. So anyway, take a look at that at your leisure or have your attorney take a look at that. And um, if you have any questions and you want us to give you any further uh, analysis of it, um, we're happy to do that. Okay, smoking and the virus. Uh, As everyone seems to recognize, even occasional use or secondhand exposure may risk someone to the virus complications due to the inflammation caused by smoke. Now, Bob, I need to have myself see that and read that again because I continue to smoke a cigar or two. But obviously, (laughs) it's not good. It's not good for your lungs or anything else. Um, Also, smoking makes it more difficult for doctors to diagnose other respiratory issues. But to date, as far as we know, no studies have been performed to study whether the virus can be spread by secondhand smoke. The bottom line is it's especially a good time to consider quitting. Uh, This is something that is directed uh, primarily to me. Uh, (laughs) And uh, I was trying to give you a hint there. Yeah, and studies have begun to see whether nicotine patches may help protect against the virus. Um, While we're speaking of the virus, um, our legal beagles wanted to mention, by the way, that they just learned of a dog uh, getting the coronavirus from his uh, parents. Uh, And so uh, those folks out there have to be very careful that they 
insulate their animals from anyone who has the virus uh, because dogs can get it. And, and uh, our dogs, our beagles are looking into this matter and may be writing additionally about it when they, when they get a chance. They're very busy right now. Anyway, amendment to ban smoking. Okay. If you think the majority or two-thirds of your members of a condo, for example, want to get rid of smoking inside and outside, you can ban it entirely or you can ban it just on the common elements. If it's just on the common elements, maybe it can be done by way of a rule as opposed to a bylaw matter, but that uh, may be subject to question. Um, and of course, whenever you pass an amendment, like that, you've got to put in parameters in terms of how you're going to be able to enforce it realistically, uh, and uh, do you have the ability to enforce it. Uh, you may want to ban all types of smoking, including tobacco and marijuana. You may want to ban vaping. Um, you may be willing to grandfather current smokers, so you may allow a phase period in which for them to quit which I think is kind of difficult, but that's maybe necessary in order for you to get that kind of provision passed, depending on how many people in your condo or your homeowner association, uh, how many of them smoke. Um, if you take a less aggressive approach may mean that it is more defensible in court if challenged. So you may want to leave uh, some stop gaps for people that that are smoking now you want to it's sort of like banning uh leases you know you may have to grandfather those people that are leasing their units at this point uh in order to uh get it passed and of course you have to be realistic about whether you're going to get the uh amendment uh approved by the members um now a greater prohibition against smoking means a greater obligation for the association to the to enforce the bylaws in what might otherwise be a neighbor to neighbor issue so the bottom line is that even if you have a ban on smoking and even if the ban has been properly passed there may be a situation where the, the association decides that it is not going to get involved in enforcing it on a neighbor versus another neighbor where only perhaps two people are involved because uh, only two people are involved and the neighbor in question has authority to pursue it under the documents. The unfortunate thing for the neighbor who's complaining is that he may not be able to recoup his legal fees, whereby the association would, if it prevailed, have the right to recoup its legal fees uh, at least in a condo project and, of course, in a homeowner association if the documents so provide, and if they don't, they should. Uh, the homeowner association documents should provide in any bylaw enforcement or collection matter that the association, if successful, should be able to recoup its reasonable attorney fees. Oh, I see a number of people writing in saying reasonable attorney fees is an oxymoron. Would you uh, eliminate that? Please, uh, I don't want that uh, hindering our our session here. Oh, okay. Of course. So, um, in any event, um, let's talk a little bit about a important case that came out from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, the federal court, called Davis versus Echo Valley Condo Association. Um, What's interesting about that case is that when it first was filed, I was invited on the Let It Rip program on uh, Fox by uh, uh, by by Charlie. What's his last name? Um, Lang Langdon. Langdon. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie Langdon. And I was opposing the plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, and I frankly told him at the time that they aren't going to win. You know, that, that I, I and, and, you know, we were debating a little bit about it. Um, and then the case went to district court, U.S. District Court, and the district court uh, agreed, if I recall correctly, with uh, the defendants, 
One of them was yes. a management company that they sued, as well as the board of the association. Um, the the problem was that the uh, they, the plaintiffs were uh, seeking a ban on smoking as a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act, given that they had asthma and other health conditions. And they also sought relief under the nuisance provision of the condominium documents. You know, in most every one of your documents, there's a provision that no owner can cause, quote, a nuisance. Uh, and if they do, then the association has a basis to go after them. It's sort of a catch-all uh, clause. Uh, the Court of Appeals affirmed the ban, uh, affirmed stating that the ban would not constitute an accommodation and would instead be a fundamental change in the association's smoking policy by banning an activity that is otherwise lawful. So it, it doesn't result in a co in accommodation. It, it basically results in what the Supreme Court would call the structural law of the condominium requiring an amendment to the condominium documents. Moreover, the court said that a nuisance, nuisance prohibition did not apply because in the absence of a specific prohibition on smoking, the court found that the bylaws allow smoking. Um, so, you know, that's what the court said. Many things are restricted, such as how many pets you can have, signs, things of that sort. But the court's reasoning allows us to conclude that generally, if smoking is allowed, it cannot be a nuisance. Uh, the case, of course, will carry weight when trying to rely on the nuisance provisions uh, prohibiting smoking, smoking uh, which will likely not be successful. The case is significant, especially for Michigan and other states in the jurisdiction of the Sixth Circuit, because trial courts across the nation have previous, previously reached different decisions on the nuisance question, which seem to be driven by specific circumstances of each case, and I would submit that that's still the case, that you have to look at each particular case and and make a determination, probably with the benefit of legal advice, uh, just to decide how to how to handle it. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, the Davis case, by the way, presented no evidence that her neighbors had unique smoking habits. So that that was something else. There are other cases that have gone uh, both ways, um, uh, but there is a, a, a Colorado case that says that the bylaws banning smoke, smoking will be found uh, to be enforceable. Uh, and the implication in the case uh, in the Sixth Circuit seems to say the same thing. So. You know, the board is going to be held, as they are in many instances, to a good faith standard. I mean, if the board just ignores somebody complaining about smoking, uh, just says, I'm sorry, uh, we're not going to do anything, uh, I don't think that's a smart thing to do. I think the board has to respond in some meaningful manner to try to deal with the situation, try to uh, resolve the situation, particularly if they don't have a ban on smoking. Uh, the board wants to look good in terms of how they responded to this particular problem. And to do nothing is not a smart thing to do any more than to do nothing with respect to any complaint filed by a member of the association uh, is not a good idea. I can't tell you how many calls I get a week from people who say, you know, I've written the management company. I've called the management company a hundred times. You know, they're not responding to me. They don't get back to me. Um, they they don't even tell the board of directors what's going on. You can't do that management company because you end up getting sued. And that's not just fulfilling your fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, now, the other side of the coin is that sometimes the co-owner doesn't like what the management company is telling them. You know, people often say, hey, they never told me. Well, they told you, you just didn't like what they were telling you. So you tuned it out, so to speak. So, you know, there are obviously two sides to every story. And I've been involved, obviously, in re representing the association when the co-owner complains. And also, of course, on occasion, representing the co-owner 
where the association or the board is uh, not listening to the complaints because they don't want to spend the money, which is usually the reason. Uh, so that's pretty much what I wanted to point out in terms of smoking in the condo. Uh, it is a hot issue, no pun intended, and uh, it is something that boards gonna ha are going to have to consider, just like drones and chicken coops and other issues that really weren't in the forefront of bylaw documents or bylaw amendments four or five years ago, but now we have to take into consideration and in upgrading community association documents, many of which have not been altered in 20, 30, sometimes 40 years. So again, and this is just a statement that, hey, managers, get your, docu get your clients' documents upgraded because there are protections in those documents that we typically put in that will save them more than the cost of doing the documents if they ever get into litigation. Uh, that's just a fact. And so there is no rational reason why a board should not be examining their documents and getting them upgraded. And if they want to deal with smoking and marijuana and anything else, now's the time to do it, especially when the homeowners and board members are uh, sitting at home this is a great time to approach them about concentrating on getting these documents upgraded. That's pretty much all I have to say at this point. I'm happy to take some questions uh, and we can go from there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Meisner. Um, so as I, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, there's a questions uh, section and in your uh, control panel there for, for our attendees. Uh, if you have a question for Mr. Meisner about smoking, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, uh, enter your question there. Uh, yeah, if you I have any see... suggestions on, yeah, if you have any suggestions on what brand of cigar you would recommend, just you know, <laughs> let me know. Or a good program to quit. <laughs> um, okay, so we have. Or if you want to send here. me a box of, you know, if you're so appreciative of this <laughs> webinar and you want to send me a box of cigars, just send it to the office. <laughs> right. Um, so here's an interesting question. Deborah asks, uh, do the rules and regulations carry as much weight as the bylaws? No, they absolutely do not. Uh, the standard of establishing the enforceability of the rules is placed on the association. The burden of showing the enforceability of the, uh, of the bylaws is placed on the coner. In other words, the bylaws are presumed to be reasonable, uh, and the uh, coner would have to prove that they're not reasonable. Whereas, if there is a rule, the association that's trying to enforce it would have to prove that the rule is reasonable. At least there's case law to that effect. But uh, the bylaws are recorded, and they are the what is called the structural law of the association. The rules, which are typically promulgated by the board of directors, do not have the same effect, and they can only be used to supplement the structural law. So, uh, no, they don't have the same legal effect. And uh, if you're going to ban smoking, to me, that is, and the courts have said, a fundamental change in the physical, or I should say the structural law of the uh, development and consequently would have to be done in my judgment uh, with respect to uh, a bylaw amendment. Mm -hmm. Now, where you smoke it or where you don't smoke it, they may have some authority uh, to promulgate a rule about that, uh, depending on the nature of the bylaw amendment that they've uh, passed. Mm -hmm. But that's a great that's a great question. And thinking about rules and policies, um, do, you, do you recommend that uh, perhaps thinking about a uh, smoking complaint policy uh, might be a good idea to sort of support um, when, when and when, when the board will not uh, get involved in, in uh, certain, certain issues between neighbors? Well, uh you know, it, it's. I, I'd hate to have a policy that says 
per se that when there's only two co-owners involved, one neighbor versus another, the association mm-hmm. will not get involved. Um, I, I would say that uh, I wouldn't necessarily have a written policy, but certainly depending on what the decision of the board is, they should uh, have a clear understanding or a clear statement as to why they are engaged in it or not engaged in it, because there may be circumstances or extenuating circumstances, even on a neighbor to neighbor issue where the board feels compelled to to do something. For example, it might be the first time that the smoking ban uh, is sought to be enforced. So if the board just says, no, nah, I'm not going to enforce it, we'll leave it to the co-owner, that might not be a smart thing to do because it might be the first, it might be the time where the association asserts itself and decides to enforce the smoking ban. Or there may be circumstances that one of the co-owners really does have asthma and is affected and, um, you know, it's a life or death situation and, you know, maybe the board feels compelled to to get involved. So I'm just pointing out that the board does have some flexibility, whether or not they exercise it or not in a given situation uh, should be done with the advice of counsel. Very good. And um, and we have some other concerns about uh, being expressed about um, would small small children being involved be a, uh, a special uh, consideration? Um, well, again, the, the secondhand smoke, um, uh, you know, I don't know that that necessarily is going to make the difference from a legal standpoint. Uh, it, gets, it depends on whether or there's a prohibition on smoking if there's not a prohibition on smoking, I'm not sure that the fact that you have small children is going to impress the court because, you know, if they're saying that smoking is not a nuisance and short of a ban on smoking, we're not going to change the, the structural law. I don't think that the fact that you have small children is going to make any difference. Right. Do you, do you think it might be helpful if you were trying to pursue, um, at, at least politically within the association, a, uh, a campaign uh, to to get a ban in place um, to you know point well, that out? Hey, we have we have a lot of small children involved. Uh, oh yeah, uh, I mean I think yeah, I think yeah. it it becomes yeah it becomes a political contest like everything else. Um, mm-hmm. If you need two thirds of the coners to go along with it. Um, you're going to need two thirds of the co-owners to agree that a smoking ban is is a, is a good idea. Uh, and again, it depends upon the uh, the nature of the of the personnel at the uh, at the community. Uh, in my particular situation in Florida, uh, I don't know how many smokers there actually were, but I know that. You know, the association, when I went on my campaign, knew that there would be resistance. And, you know, while it wasn't uh, a great analogy, uh, one could argue that, you know, the next thing they want to do is ban alcohol on your patio. Well, that that's never going to be approved. And that's what I had to resort to. So, again, if you're going to go to try to amend the documents, you've got to size up your community and you've got to... Uh, politicize the request for the smoking ban using whatever data or information or whatever other tactic you have available to get it passed. Yeah. And I I believe we've done uh, maybe an an informal poll uh, uh, before. Is that correct? Uh, uh, So we've, uh, you know, maybe an association isn't sure whether or not a, uh, uh, an amendment might be be passed to prohibit smoking. They might uh, just send out, you know, and not a vote, but uh, a, a poll as to what uh, you know people yeah. might be comfortable with. Right. And uh, so that might be a good idea to to begin with, right? right? That that's possible. That's what, of course, they did in in my condo in Florida. But you uh, know, it had had the effect of me mobilizing. Uh, so it cuts both ways. Uh, 
you know, it, it may be a good idea. You know, I, I seem to think that the best thing is for the association to go ahead and get it proposed, submit it to the coners, give the reasons why, you know, it's already a fact accompli. Uh, if they do action without a meeting, they can personalize uh, the vote process by knocking on doors or at least, at least six feet away and or calling them or getting a period of time for them to submit their vote hopefully in the affirmative. So, you know, again, that's a business decision or political decision that each association has to make. Sure. And I have a few questions about this. Um, can the board of directors make it a rule in the common elements? Um, and I believe that we mentioned that briefly, but um, uh, maybe just uh, address that again uh, about uh, to the what to what extent uh it, it might be uh banned banned by a rule in the common elements well uh that's a deep subject um the uh i suppose again if you're talking about a you know the 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 bylaws typically give the board of directors the right to uh take care of the common elements and control the common elements and administer the common elements and I suppose the association could try to pass a rule banning smoking on the common elements uh, as opposed to a bylaw amendment. Um, the argument for the association doing that is that they have control over the the way the common elements are administered. Um, but what if, for example, um, they said they you know, they allow dogs in the condo, but they pass a rule that says no dogs on the common elements. You know, would that be considered an, uh, an infringement on the right of the co-owners to have dogs? I'm saying that that would be, you know, they could try it and see if it's enforceable. Uh, somebody could question it saying, look, you need more than a rule to do that because they would appoint to the Sixth Circuit case and say, you know, this is a fundamental change in the law. Uh, so there'd be the, the typical argument that, hey, it's within the rulemaking power of the board to administer and maintain the common elements vis-a-vis -vis the fact that it's a substantial change in the structural law of the condo project, and therefore it would be, it would need a bylaw amendment. The safe oh, okay. way to do it, the safe way to do it is by a way of a bylaw amendment that's that's pretty foolproof, um, assuming that the amendment is reasonable on its face. That's not to say that a rule wouldn't be held by some court to be enforceable, but it's problematic. Great, great. But don't but don't right. quote me on. It. <laughs> of course, thank you very much, Mr. Meisner, and um, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, uh, wrap it up here. Um, Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, if you do have some additional questions about how we can help you get a prohibition in place, um, please do give us a call. Uh, we can take a look at your existing governing documents and give you a recommendation for how to do that. Um, do they know where to send the cigars? They <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, just ship them to the office. We'll be able to get, I'm sure you'll be able yeah, to get them eventually right. very, very yeah. soon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just wanted to be sure uh, that. Right. So, uh, we just want to thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we will be emailing all who registered a link to the recording of this webinar. So look for that to come very soon. Uh, please do feel free to share that recording with your fellow board members, co-owners and managers. Uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, and finally, uh, we'd just like to invite you to join us for our full four-week webinar course that's going to be held over four Tuesday evenings uh, in May, which is our Advanced Community Association Operation course. And uh, I'll also ensure that everybody has information in an email uh, that will follow immediately after this webinar. So thanks again for joining us, for everybody. Thanks for your great questions. Uh, be safe and have a great afternoon. Thanks a lot.
Okay, Mark.